My name is Satya Thalm. I'm the director of the Financial Markets Working Group at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, I wanted to mention a specific project that we're working on. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I wanted to briefly introduce our speakers for today. Uh, and I'll, I'll remind everyone that uh, those green forms in front of you are surveys. We do take those seriously. So a reminder to drop those out with one of our staff members on, on your way out. And we will reserve time for a Q&A at the end. Um, so let me briefly introduce our speakers. We'll start with uh, Dr. Arnold Kling. Arnold Kling is a member of the Financial Markets Working Group. Um, uh, he uh, received his PhD in economics from MIT. He's been in various times of life an entrepreneur, a staff member uh, at a government agency. He was an economist at both the Federal Reserve and Freddie Mac. Uh, he's, like I said, an entrepreneur. He's an academic. Uh, and an active member of our group, has uh, testified several times on financial regulation, housing reform issues in both the House and Senate. Uh, and Dr. Anthony Sanders, also a member of the Financial Markets Working Group, has also testified multiple times uh, in, in, in the House and Senate, received his PhD in economics from the University of Georgia, is a distinguished professor of real estate finance at George Mason University, uh, has also taught at University of Georgia, I'm sorry, Ohio State, University of Chicago, Arizona State, UT Austin. What other state schools am I missing? Yeah, all over the Big Ten, Pac-10, whatever. Um, and uh, also, uh, in a previous life, was head of asset-backed securities research at Deutsche Bank. So both of our speakers bring experience uh, both in academia and, and outside. I should mention the context of this uh, course we're doing today. Um, I'm coordinating a project on GSE reform. Both Anthony and Arnold are contributors to that project. And I think somewhere maybe on the tables or, or we're out front, uh, we have a, a summary of some of those. This, this project is intended to provide a pluralistic view of GSE re reform going forward. One of the lingering institutional questions uh, in post Dodd-Frank and, and post-crisis is how do we do reform housing finance? I think. The consensus is that the status quo for GSEs is not sustainable, but there isn't necessarily consensus on what to do. Uh, the approach we took was not to offer up one single proposal, but to offer several different proposals, recognizing that there are certain assumptions about what a post-GSE world would look like, since none of us in this room in our lifetime have ever lived in that world. Um, so, and like I said, Anthony and Arnold are were two contributors. There are also three other papers as part of this project. They're released as working papers now. They'll be released as a special study compendium in, we're anticipating, early June. Uh, the other contributors are Pete Wallison, Larry J. White, and Dwight Jaffe. Um, so I'll remind you, we'll, the presentations will be about 30 minutes or so. That way we can uh, leave time for Q&A at the end. And with that, I'll hand it over to Arnold. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Satya. Um, feel free to interrupt, actually, with questions during this. Uh, I, I do well with interruptions. Uh, okay, so my paper talks about two approaches to GSE reform. Uh, so it wasn't enough to have five papers. I had to have two in mind. Um, and the two, the, pro the approach that I prefer is to just gradually phase out Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, back the government out of the housing finance business, and just let whatever would naturally emerge, emerge. Um, <clears throat> for those who fear that and just w w w would, are so afraid of it they wouldn't even want to try it, then I would recommend just restoring Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae to the status quo that they had earlier. Uh, several years ago, rather than trying to design a new form of government guarantee. My fear is that anything new will have all of the risks that we had with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, plus the very important additional risk of throwing out institutional knowledge, both uh, <coughs> among the institutions doing the mortgage lending and uh, among the regulators. So uh, my line is that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae almost worked. Uh, they were working for quite a while. We could conceivably try to make them work again. 
Again, that, my first choice, though, would be to back the uh, government out of the mortgage market completely. I, in the paper, <coughs> I call that the Jimmy Stewart banker approach because my best guess is that if the government really backed out of the mortgage market, a lot of it would revert to local lending undertaken by banks. Uh, my guess is that the typical loan would have a 20% down payment. Uh, not every loan, there would be some loans with lower down payments, but the typical loan would be 20%. And I think the market, the housing market would be much more stable if the, if the typical loan were a 20% down payment. When you get into the low down payment lending, you, you create a situation where the market can, works very well when it's rising, becomes very uh, <coughs> ebullient when it's rising, and then completely falls apart when prices stop rising. So it really amplifies the cyclical nature of the market. It, 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 it destroys communities by sort of creating this boom-bust cycle within communities. Um, so I think that that would be the typical loan. I think that the, if the government backed out completely, it's possible that the 30-year fixed rate mortgage interest rate would be a bit higher than it is now relative to, let's say, a five-year mortgage rate, like which is what's very common in Canada, is the five-year rollover mortgage. And that might or might not lead to different mix of consumer decisions in mortgage lending. I mean, I think Americans are very used to the 30-year fixed rate and probably still would gravitate toward it. But it's possible that some would gravitate toward other loans. Finally, I'll say that when I talk about backing the government out of the housing market, I believe that there is a role for consumer protection in finance in general. Um, I think that people who are financially unsophisticated are easily preyed upon. Uh, I'm not sure the government does a very good job of protecting them. I can imagine, it, I, I can think of better ways of protecting people than, than what we have. But I think there is, that is a goal worth uh, worth attempting. And so uh, when I talk about backing the government out, what I'm talking about is backing the government out of subsidizing, guaranteeing, shaping uh, the mortgage market. <clears throat> I think the government is in this business of shaping the mortgage market because of a number of misconceptions. Uh, the three misconceptions that I want to talk about are, <clears throat> first of all, a misconception that Private lenders are basically in the business to set up borrowers to fail, and nonprofits and government uh, know how to set up borrowers to succeed. So that's the first misconception. The second misconception is that borrowing to buy a house is the, the way for the middle class to save in America. Uh, these are sort of, I mean, another term for these would be half-truths, because there, there's some partial truth to, to these. And the final, the third misconception is that securitization is absolutely necessary to have a, a well-functioning mortgage market. Okay, so let's go back to the first misconception <coughs> that uh, private lenders only set up borrowers to fail and uh, nonprofits and government set up borrowers to succeed. In general, it is not in the interest of mortgage lenders or lenders of any sort to uh, deliberately structure loans so that borrowers cannot repay. Lenders are better off if borrowers repay the loans. Uh, they, you now, lenders might take chances. I mean, you don't know who's going to repay, and they might say, well, if, if there's if there are 100 borrowers and each one of them has a 1% chance of defaulting, we can take that risk, price for that risk. But they don't set out to, uh, to have borrowers fail. I think in the, in the recent, you know, under securitization, the link between the intent of people investing in loans and the behavior of mortgage lenders kind of got broken. And that's part of the reason I don't think securitization would come back if the government backed out in what I call the Jimmy Stewart banker scenario. That is, I, I think that the moral hazard problems, the 
agency problems that uh, exist in securitization are pretty severe. Uh, you, the uh, yes, as, uh, if I'm investing in a loan, I don't want a loan that's going to default. But under securitization, whoever is originating the loan is only going to get paid if the loan is originated. They're not going to get paid for turning down the loan, for making a good decision to turn down a bad loan. Um, and that, you know, that's different under securitization than banking. Um, but in general, private lenders are not in the business of setting people up to fail. More importantly, I think the uh, I've noticed that people who have been in sort of the affordable housing community or the uh, uh, sort of the politicians who've, who've always been backing lenient lending, lending with low down payments, are very defensive about the way their the loan they, that they they encourage only good loans. Uh, I was at a hearing where uh, a woman said, you know. Of, of the loans that were originated under our program in the last 10 years, only 5% defaulted. A uh, couple things about that. First of all, a 5% default rate in mortgages is very high. It's frighteningly high. Secondly, what happened to the other 95%? So they identified people who would repay loans. They coached people to repay loans. But what happened to those people? Those people bought houses and put what little life savings they had into those houses. The loans on their houses are worth more than the houses. Their houses are underwater. So what, they've, what you've done with those other 95% is you've wiped out their life savings and they're just throw, at the moment throwing good money after bad repaying loans. They're basically bailing out their banks by paying the loans. So I don't think we should be proud of that. I mean, I don't think that was the intent of the people who designed affordable housing loans and wanted to, sh to create ways for these people to borrow. But it was the consequence, and the consequence was not good for them. And I think we need to keep that in mind. And that gets to my second point about this, the misconception that the way the American middle class saves is by borrowing a lot of money on houses. Now there's a sense in which that can be true in theory. And that's because <clears throat> when you borrow with a typical fixed rate loan, you, um, over time, as you just keep making payments. The payments don't contribute too much to equity buildup, at least at first. But as the house price goes up, you're, you, you, you build up equity. So in some sense, you commit yourself to making a payment that amounts to saving. And so you commit yourself to a savings plan. At the end of 10 or 15 years, if house prices go up, and it doesn't have to be up relative to inflation. It can just be along with general inflation. At the end of 10 or 15 years, you've got an asset in the, in the house. You've got more equity in the house than you have uh, a loan amount. So there is that sense of saving. And there have been periods of time when Americans have saved through that process, uh, particularly uh, the generation of people who bought houses in the 60s and 70s experienced a lot of saving out of that because the, the inflation took off. Their interest rates were fixed for a long time. And so people who bought houses for twenty or $30,000, and believe me, that that's, was a typical middle class house back then, maybe a little more, uh, saw them go up to 100000 or more. Uh, and so that was a savings vehicle. But that all depends on timing. It depends on timing relative to inflation, relative to interest rates, relative to the market. It's a gamble, and I wish that we would do more to teach middle class people how to save without taking that particular gamble. There have got to be other ways that people can commit to putting money into saving uh, other than taking out this mor the mortgage. And you know, the worst part about trying to ta use a mortgage as a savings vehicle, in the last several years, what happened? As soon as people build up equity, what did they do? They took cash out refis. They took second mortgages, home equity loans. 
So even when it should have worked, when, when the house, for a while when the house prices went up, it didn't work. So I, I really think we need to come up with, with some other mechanism. Um, and then my third misconception I want to deal with is that securitization is necessary to have an effective mortgage market. Um, I can certainly remember when securitization was not as, as big a part of the mortgage market. And you know, I, I believe that <coughs> if, if there are profit opportunities in mortgage lending, there are enough financial institutions interested in those opportunities that they'll find them. I think it may be difficult today for institutions to find profitable opportunities, and maybe Anthony will talk more about this because of you know, the you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHA may be buying loans at interest rates that are just unsustainably low, and so that kind of drives the private sector out. But I think if, uh, you know, if you back them out of the market, I think uh, the market will re-enter re there. Um, okay, so my overall picture for government involvement in the mortgage market is that it's based on these misconceptions. And I think, you know, when you have a, I guess I, I like to study uh, really tragic failures in history. Uh, World War I is a, I won't say a favorite, but an interesting thing to study. Vietnam, interesting thing to study. And what you find in these is that, that there are some fundamental misconceptions at work when these kinds of tragedies occur. And I think in the, the financial crisis, if you look, you will see some fundamental misconceptions. You know, misconceptions about you know, house prices can never fall, and this mis these misconceptions that I talked about uh, that, um, that, it, that people can accumulate saving all the, always by buying houses, and that uh, that government programs and uh, programs to by, by nonprofits that are well intended are, are good ideas. The, 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 some fundamental misconceptions, I think, were at work. Um, so, government, I think, overestimates the benefits of intervening in the mortgage market. There, there's this presumption that. They're, we're doing wonderful things by intervening, and you know, we're, we're the ones who are setting people up to succeed, and whereas if, if the private sector were left to itself, people would be set up to fail. So I think they overestimate the benefits and under, have underestimated the risks and the costs. And so I, I really think there's a need to kind of change the cultural mindset here in Washington about the mortgage market so that we stop overestimating the benefits of government involvement in the mortgage market and stop underestimating the risks of that involvement. It's kind of about the last section of my talk. I want to talk a little bit about history uh, because I think, uh, I, I think it helps to, to remember history uh, and to remember it correctly. One of the things that, that uh, you know, wh when does government involvement in the mortgage market begin? It, be it, begin? it begins in the Depression when millions of suburban home buyers defaulted on their loans. You know, that's not right. Who defaulted? The big defaults, the, 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 there was no, there, suburbs were not big in the Great Depression. The suburbs came in the 1950s. Uh, so what did happen? What happened was a lot of farm credit default. Most of the mortgage credit in the late 20s and 30s was farm credit, and that had a whole bunch of issues going with it. And so it wasn't the case that a horrible mortgage market developed and uh, mortgages were badly structured for the typical home buyer, and that was a big factor in the Depression. What happened was we had a big structural shift both within the agriculture and between agriculture and other sectors. And so we, and we also had a deflation, which was, you know, makes it very difficult for farmers to repay loans. So we, the story that government kind of came in and saved the day with better mortgage products, I think it, it, it was something we ought to get away from. Um, the next historical episode I would, that influenced our policy was the savings and loan crisis. And that was kind of the flip side of, you know, remember I said that 
that the generation that bought houses in the 60s and 70s did really well. Well, who did really poorly as a result of that? It was the savings and loans because they had fixed interest rates. In fact, they, there was something called Regulation Q that fixed their deposit rates. So they were, they, they, you could not compete by offering higher deposit rates. So inflation picks up in the 70s and uh, <coughs> the savings and loans can no longer attract money because their interest rates are too low. And that's, that was called disintermediation. It eventually was relieved by letting interest rates rise, but that didn't matter because the savings and loans were, had issued mortgages at 5 6% actually higher interest rates than, than are being issued now. Uh, inflation eventually took off to double digit rates. Interest rates went up to 10, 15, 20 percent. And so you can't make money borrowing at 15 and with a fixed portfolio lending at six. And so the SNLs uh, went bankrupt. And somehow the lesson we learned from that is that we needed Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae even though Fannie Mae was just as bankrupt as the SNLs, it just was you know, kind of quietly allowed to continue. Uh, we, we, another lesson we learned, it was probably a good lesson, was that we needed to mark to market portfolios because the SNLs were carrying underwater mortgages at book value and that enabled them to continue in existence longer. We also learned that we needed to do tighter regulation of capital and of deposit insurance. So the 1980s, you might, yeah, one, again, there's this myth that, oh, the 1980s, we just deregulated everything. In fact, because of the savings and loan crisis, we tightened up, or thought we tightened up, regulation of banks and savings and loans. And I think that's important to remember as we go through now, we're, oh, we have Dodd-Frank, we've tightened things up. We fixed all the problems. That's exactly the way they felt after the savings and loan crisis. They felt that they had successfully regulated, uh, tightened up regulations for banks and thrifts. So, but what you will find, uh, if you need another one of my Mercatus papers called Not What They Have in Mind, is that those regulations actually made things, ultimately helped produce the, the more recent crisis. Um, finally, in the recent crisis, the history, what is the, hi the correct history of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae? The, for some reason, it's become a very political issue. I could imagine people on the left blasting Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae as these profit-seeking enterprises, you know, shareholder-owned, blah, blah, blah. But no, they want to defend, they want to say Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae just followed the market, they were nice, it was the evil private market that was the problem. I don't know why it has to be that, that political. Um, I, I mean, just the, the reality is you know, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were clearly a big part of the problem and, and of the failure. And, and it's a complete shock to me. It certainly came as a shock to me that they failed because I know they had risk management systems and methods in place that could have prevented their uh, getting into trouble like this. So briefly, my story of Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae is that they were misregulated. Uh, on the one hand, they uh, were not regulated well in terms of safety and soundness. Somebody should have been on them about their, you know, when I was there, it was in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, the typical Freddie Mac loan was a 20% down payment loan, and if you went below 20%, you, we could go all the way down to 10% if you had mortgage insurance. Okay, they went away from that, and they went away from a lot of other risk standards as well. Where were their regulators while they were doing that? Um, in one sense, perhaps the regulators were pushing them into that. Perhaps, perhaps not, but uh, the affordable housing goals might have been part of the impetus for their relaxation of credit standards. And those credit standards, I think, were very important to their safety and soundness. I think we had a regulatory model based on stress testing that said, well, if house prices fall by this much, you know, this is how much capital you need. That was, I think, a valid regulatory model that should have worked. 
Uh, it, it becomes less plausible if you have a lot of loans in your portfolio with very low down payments because then the, the variation is too high for, that, for, that kind of, for any kind of uh, stress test of that sort to be robust. But if, if you have reasonable limits on low down payment lending and on other risk factors, then I think that stress testing could have worked and, and was working for a long time. Okay, so uh, to recap, I would say that, you know, again, the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae model almost worked. It, worked with, it would have worked with a different regulatory emphasis that focused more intently on safety and soundness and didn't involve trying to push Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae into uh, loan areas where, that were risky. So it really came pretty close to working. Uh, but if you step back further, the rationale for government involvement in the mortgage market is pretty weak. The benefits are lower than what people think, and the costs are higher. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here, and I agree fundamentally with almost everything Arnold said. I will uh, point out my, where we disagree because he's going before me, so I don't want to repeat all his talking points. But essentially, what I'm recommending in my report that is on the Mercatus website is that, once again, Fannie and Freddie serve to purchase loans from banks or other uh, originators. Now again, if we go back to what Arnold was saying, that's a very puzzling thing because originally these were set up to buy bad loans from bank balance sheets. And then what we did over time was we allowed them to persist and the striking thing is that I've always found fundamentally flawed with their model is that they had a gold standard for buying mortgages. 20% down, high FICO score, and that's when Fannie and Freddie were actually doing pretty well, with the exception of one blow up at Fannie because of interest rates. But is that really what we want the government involved in, is riskless lending to the housing market? <laughs> Um, we have the FHA, which does their great first-time home buyer and low-down payment program. But why don't we need Freddie and Fannie to what we call crowd out the private sector and buy all the low-quality loans, or high-quality loans, excuse me. By buying out all those 20% down high FICO score, we're, who does the rest of the lending? You have FHA over here. You have Fannie and Freddie over here. The middle ground is the banks. So the banks get stuck with risky lending, either for their own balance sheet or to securitize. And that's kind of how we ended up where we are. Um, do we really need that? Do we really need the government to guarantee the highest pos or quality loans? The answer is no. The private sector can come along and do 20% down high FICO score loans themselves. Those markets worked. And if we take a look at the data from Wall Street, those were actually performed very well. What didn't perform well, of course, is subprime and the infamous Alt-A. But again, those were really low down payment, low credit score borrowing in some cases. So that's why they didn't do that. So what I'm proposing, very similar to what others like Arnold are proposing, is a five-year phase out. In other words, stick our feet in the water. Don't shut it down immediately, which some have advocated. Use this over five years. Test to see the support levels in the housing market. Uh, if we start lowering the conforming loan limit, which I recommend, if, but if you do it too fast and the housing market just stalls, we may have to slow that down a little bit. But you put on the back end a hard five-year shutdown. So everyone in the world who wants to invest in mortgages knows that the government guarantee goes away. Now, FHA will still have their guaranteed program. So I'm not talking about getting rid of first-time home buyer or low-down payment support from the FHA. I'm simply saying there's no reason for Fannie and Freddie to do this when the private market could do it themselves. Now, what will replace Fannie and Freddie? Again, it's not as if they go away and suddenly no one makes any loans. There are three possibilities and they should all be done. First of all, bank balance sheet lending. Now, I have to warn you, that's not in the cards in the short run because, as we know, if you read the paper, banks are not in the best of health at the moment. 
But again, over time, they will gradually start working off those loans. The good news is, and I'll show you this later in the slides, the banks now have been able to start up the foreclosure cycle, so they're getting houses off their books, which means that housing prices are coming down. Ooh, but that means recovery is taking place, and that's actually good. Covered bonds. Covered bonds um, are great. It's the uh, Danish model, which is also done by Germany in which you have uh, your debt matched up with the maturity of the mortgages, so you're kind of interest rate hedged, so that's a big problem Fannie and Freddie are facing right now, along with the banks. And that, that is a superb model, although I argue if properly revealed, you can have a lower quality version of covered bonds, but we'll get back to that in a second. And then revival of the securitization market. Arnold and I probably disagree on this one. I see nothing wrong with securitization. I think it's a, it's a good process to get loans off the bank's balance sheet. I just don't think taxpayers should subsidize that particular niche of the market. Okay, the government guarantee. Well, once again, we've discussed this. Uh, Arnold has just say no in a Senate testimony, which I like. The guarantee is not actually necessary. And again, one study that uh, I did a few years ago showed that Fannie and Freddie save consumers 30 basis points on their loans. 30, a quarter of a percent. For all that risk and the explosion that Freddie and Fannie just created, all for a quarter of a percent. Is that worth it? Uh, no, Bob Haggerty of the Wall Street Journal is writing a book on Freddie and Fannie and he sent me an email and the title of the email was when Schumer loves Sanders. I testified in the Senate that it saves consumers 30 basis points, and Senator Schumer said, that's good. Alan Greenspan said, I can't remember what Greenspan said, but kind of heartily disagreed with that. For all the risks you're taking on, 30 basis points isn't sufficient. Now again, the missing thing is, is that Fannie and Freddie do buy loans from bank balance sheets, but the private sector can do that just as well, and again, with sufficiently high down payment, That'll work. And again, we have to be very careful because the guarantees are really tricky animals. They actually encourage risk taking. If I know something is guaranteed, you take on more risk. It's just the way guarantees work. And we've already seen that we took on a lot of risk in the housing market, and what happened? Well, it was risky. It plummeted, and a lot of particularly at-risk households really got crushed by this, by being kind of, not hypnotized, but kind of really encouraged that home ownership's the only path. And again, home ownership has its place if you can afford it, but having you know, adequate, affordable rental property is just as important. Now, I want to go through a couple of the things, taking a look at the state of the housing market, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. This is from the Fed of St. Louis. Take a look at housing starts, how housing starts. Let's go to the right-hand corner. It's dead. We're just not producing new housing. Why? Well, take a look at housing recessions. Every time we've had a recession in the past, which is the dark blue area, you'll notice that housing starts rebound. The housing industry leads us out of recessions. Look at the recent recession. Not only is it not leading us out at all, it's getting worse. Why is that? Once again, and I blame part of this, not all of it. There's plenty of blame to go around. I blame part of this on the guarantee. We pumped so much money into the housing market with a guarantee. We got a big bubble and then kaboom. And it's, it's going to take a while to recover from this. Uh, gross equity extraction. What fuels, in particular some areas of the country, what fueled a lot of the economy in 2005 and 6 was people taking home equity loans, borrowing money and all that appreciation they just earned in their houses. So if you take a look at the top, back in about 2006, 2007, we had big equity extraction, which was fundamentally funding what? F1, Ford F-150 purchases, home improvements, more furniture for your house. Look what's happened since housing prices have come down. Not only is it zero, it's negative, which means we're not doing this anymore. So that, that's a variable we've completely taken out of the economy. One, another reason why the economy is very slow to recover. MBA purchases. 
This is an index the Mortgage Bankers Association produces to indicate how well the home purchases are doing. Are we expecting any? Lower right? No. Here's the one that Arnold and I have discussed before. Refinancing. Fannie and Freddie, uh, the refinancing share of Freddie and Fannie loans is astronomical. But here's the problem. <clears throat> when mortgage rates get really low, as they are now, and I, I think most of us agree that interest rates will probably go up. I think even Chairman Bernanke has uttered that. Who's going to refinance? Nobody. Refinancings are going to be really low for a while. And there's an implication for that in a second I'll get to. Now, Dodd-Frank. Let's bring up Dodd-Frank and its interaction with Freddie and Fannie. Again, I'm arguing we try to downscale Freddie and Fannie to zero over five years. But Dodd-Frank puts in some very interesting uh, positions. Because banks have a limited capacity to take on new mortgages, who's going to buy all these conforming, or QRMs, conforming residential mortgages? which have been kind of encouraged that they be 30-year fixed and plain vanilla arms, which means no teaser rates. Any mortgage innovation is now kind of kaput. Now, what that means is we're going to need someone to buy all that paper, at least in the short run. So Fannie and Freddie are kind of, uh, have been anointed to stay around for a while unt until we can get alternative platforms going. So right now, Fannie, Freddie, and the FHA we have to put them in there just to be honest. Fannie, Freddie, and the FHAs are the only game in town. 95% market share. Even Dave Stevens, the former Assistant Secretary of HUD, I think he might be, still be there for a few more days, um, has come out and said the same thing, saying, you know, the HUD footprint, my gosh, we have to get them back to historical levels. But the question is, unless we have the, the private market going, <coughs> this is just going to create Again, almost this kind of clamor to keep Freddie and Fannie around. And it's important to realize that the taxpayers bear this risk. Now, let's discuss a paper that I did with Mike Lee, a former chief economist for Freddie and also worked for Countrywide. Here's where we are compared to the rest of the world. If you take a look at the United States, we have 95% 10-year or more fixed rate mortgages. In reality, most of those are 30. We are the only economy in the world with all, almost all 30-year fixed rate mortgages. Everyone else, even France, Korea, everyone, take a look. The closest competitor we have is France, and they're two-thirds. The UK, which uh, I like to highlight, the UK actually has considerably lower. They have a mixture of very short-term fixed and arms. Why? Why is this? Well, one reason is, is that we've had this guarantee in place for so long, and a 30-year fixed rate mortgage, from the consumer's standpoint, is a wonderful contract for most people. And in that paper we go on to discuss, it's good, but again, the one thing we're still trying to get across to everybody is that risk, interest rate risk and, and, and credit risk, Somebody bears the risk. If the consumers bear none, that means all risk is shifted over to either the lender or Freddie and Fannie. And when Freddie and Fannie are sitting on a stockpile, a huge stockpile, a nuclear stockpile, of, of billions of dollars of low interest rate loans with some credit risk, and interest rates suddenly start shifting upwards, which might happen, what <clears throat> we'll find out to tomorrow. That's going to cause some extreme harm at Freddie and Fannie. So piling up every, I'll get to that. Oh, but they haven't sold them all yet. That's right. And they haven't sold all their mortgages off portfolio. They're unwinding them. But then it still goes someplace. So somebody's bearing that interest rate risk. Thank you for pointing that out. Now here's 30-year fix. So you can kind of see how we got into the problem. We're in 30-year fix since about 1980. Has just gradually come down, very low. And when we got rates this low, this is what I mean. So whoever is sitting on a lot of low interest rate debt, 
and again, which doesn't behave very well when interest rates go up. We'll get to that, the swap side of it. Now here's ARMS. Now again, Mike Lee and I are just advocating that we should have more mortgage choice. If you want to pick 30 year, fantastic. Just be aware, somebody has to hold that risk. ARMS are more risky for the consumer. That's true. But the more we can kind of have risk sharing, and generally that's sometimes a very good thing. But the point I wanted to make is, is that the most rates have really gone up on ARMS is about a little over 7% back in 2000. They've been actually behaved very well. There's not the fear. I think the fear tactic, Arnold, can you pass me my water, please? Thanks. The fear thing about ARMS, again, may be appropriate, but I'm, not, I'm saying it really isn't there. Okay, let's take a look at the market conditions that we're under right now. So if we're discussing getting rid of Freddie and Fannie, let's discuss what's going on. Now here is Freddie and Fannie debt, debentures. This is not MBS. This is what they borrow at. Again, I would consider the fact that Freddie is now trading at uh, negative yields to Treasury is irrelevant. That's just a measurement error. But take a look. They're re it's really trading at about 20 basis points over Treasury. What that means is Freddie and Fannie debt is really the sh what I call shadow treasury debt. It's just treasury debt with a, with a spread of 20 basis points. Point, going forward, is there's approximately $12 trillion sitting on the sideline waiting to see what happens to us and the global economy. What would attract people back into the United States housing market? Spreads of 20 basis points? Very uninteresting. Let's go to MBS spreads. Uh, this is um, Fannie Mae spreads. Now, their spreads are trading at about 80 basis points over treasuries, approximately. Once again, take the uber low treasury rate we have now at 80 basis points. Is that compelling to buy? For some institutions, sure. Other institutions, absolutely not. That's not going to provide the new funding we are going to need going forward for the entire system. Now this may, ooh, this looked ugly. It looks much better on my high definition overhead. But what it's saying is right now, the price for MBS has gone up to 102. Once again, this is somewhat the market seeking, people looking at treasuries and going, ooh, those rates are terrible. So they can get about a you know, 80 basis point, what we call pickup by buying MBS. Good. It's not the long, wrong, wrong, uh, long run solution, it's a short run solution. So this is really not sufficient to attract interest in the market. Okay, as you know, Chairman Bernanke is out there frantically. One of his goals of Fed policy right now is trying to induce inflation in the housing market. How's it working? It's not working very well, and again, not his fault. The inven staggering inventories of housing are coming on the market, really depressing prices. But we are seeing commodity, oil, and other types of assets going through the roof. Bear in mind, those are assets used in the production and consumption. Housing, once it's built, is not used for the production of anything. It's shelter, <laughs> and, and thank goodness we have it. But this is why it's going to be much more reticent to react to inflationary pressures than it would be commodities like oil, food, et cetera. So it's very hard to raise prices through inflation, although I'm, that's what he would like to see. Now getting back to another point. Here's aggregate, the uh, red line is, is GSC and agency debt. So this is primarily Freddie and Fannie debt, although there's some flub federal home loan bank debt thrown in here too. Just to give you the idea, is that here was federal government debt. Now this is just externally invested debt. This is not debt held within the government itself. So when they quote 14 trillion, that's mis misleading in a way. It's not quite that much held externally to other investors. A lot of that's internally held. But if you take a look at this, since 1989, the GSE debt, which again, Fannie and Freddie bonds, and the federal debt, my gosh, we, and I'll include Fannie and Freddie as we, we have issued almost, until just recently, as much debt for housing markets as we did for the entire economy. Any chance that might 
create a uh, bubble in the housing market? Well, again, there's other factors in there. But this is just telling you how much debt Freddie and Fannie and the federal home loan bank system have pumped into the system. I'm not sure that was optimal. Okay. Again, just a quick review so we can see why Chairman Bernanke is having trouble with housing prices. Here's the monetary base. It's exploded recently through his various uh, QE1 and QE2. Here's the um, Fed funds rate. He dropped it to virtually zero, trying to pump the market up, and including housing. And by the way, again, depending on how you look at this, if you're worried about the arm resets, adjustable rate that causing the defaults, again, most of those have defaulted already. But again, this is another kept to keep mortgage rates low in addition. And this is uh, capacity utilization. Now what this means is, and this is kind of ominous for the housing market, again, my point is, let's please not go this path again. Let's go to another path. Rental property, et cetera, let's, let's let the private market sort this out instead of the government, again, guaranteeing things and putting, putting their foot up. Capacity utilization talks about, is really a measure of the Fed. The Fed, Bernanke and his group love this measure. It says how effective our productive capabilities are being. Meaning, are we using all our plants? Are they up to capacity, et cetera? The magic number is about 80%. That typically is when the Fed starts raising rates and easing it off. Look what's happening. Since the end of the recession, it has spiked, it skyrocketed. Meaning, capacity utilization is going through the roof. Every other time, the Fed would be ratcheting up rates to slow this down. Because you don't want this going up and exploding through 80. Then we get massive inflation. He's trying to slow this. He'll eventually be forced to slow this down. But he can't. And here's my favorite one. This is called um, velocity of money. Velocity of money really says if we print trillions of dollars, does anyone use it? Is it changing hands? So velocity talks about the rate at which money changes hands, which is growth. Velocity is very low, meaning that all the money we're printing is not doing much good. And lastly, here's bank lending. One of the reasons why we're not seeing growth is banks are not lending to where they were in 2007 yet. Primarily because, once again, we've tightened credit qual standards. Fannie and Freddie have raised their what's called LLPA, Loan Level Price Adjustments. FHA has bumped up everything. All for good reasons in terms of financial viability. But take a look at, we're just not lending money. Bottom line is, is that um, when we take a look at what we need to do going forward, we need to reduce the government footprint because even for all the best intentions in the world, we ended up with a massive bubble, it burst, and we just have to sit there and proceed uh, forward, down, or uh, sort of toning down the government, not edicts, but they, they helped enormously. But then again, there's a price to pay when they help, and they help too much, I would argue. So a 30-year fixed rate mortgage is a fine contract, but again, we should have others. We should have mortgage choice, and Dodd-Frank excludes mortgage choice. The big flaw of Dodd-Frank and Freddie and Fannie, going back to original standards the way Arnold was talking about, what about households with impaired credit? We've effectively just shut them out of the market. We let them all in, housing prices fell, and we kick them in the shins. That's, one, that's the biggest flaw of Dodd-Frank and with the Freddie and Fannie raising prices. I'm in favor of that if that's your model of choice. But again, that's why I advocate if we go, we have to open up somehow credit markets, even through covered bonds, let banks make loans to credit impaired households. I'm sorry, that uh, doesn't sound like a very good talking point, but I think we really need to do that. We can't exclude people, even worse, we can't let the government tell us what banks and lenders can do. If banks want to take on the risk and loan to a household with impaired credit, in Cleveland, Ohio, they should be able to do so. But to sit there and just carte blanche, just exclude all credit sensitive instruments and mortgage innovations, that's not the right way to go. So again, downsize Freddie and Fannie over five years, get rid of them. The market will step in to get those yields, 
That's my whole point. The yields on gar guaranteed stuff is so low, not of interest to anybody. You let that rise, and I said it could be 40 basis points, it could be 100 basis points. But once you start letting, you have risky products in the market, you will attract capital. It will come back. Don't buy that uh, excuse. Thank you very much.